Hello, and welcome to This Week in James City County. I'm your host, Renee Dolman. Today, I am once again joined by James City County's County Administrator, Scott Stevens. Welcome, Scott. Hey, good morning, Renee. It's good to be here again. It's great to have you. So, so much stuff going on. I will just let you hit the ground running. You know, Renee, I was putting together some notes thinking we had just done this not long ago, and I sort of say up front, I have a lot to cover. So we'll see. You may just have to cut me off at some point and say enough's enough for today. <laughs> um, but, it, but I am glad to be here. I always like sharing information. You make it easy to do that. So I appreciate that. It is officially summer, right? So we're into that now. And I hope people uh, are recognizing that and getting out and moving around and being socially distanced and safe in all the right ways. Uh, but I do encourage folks to, to get out and enjoy our community. We really do have a great place in terms of outdoor activities and year round is good, but summer for me is especially nice. So I would encourage folks to do that. Um, I would also, just as a early on reminder, it is also hurricane season. And so we're, I think we're all might have, well, we probably haven't missed that, but June brings that in, it runs through November. And we're all supposed to be able to look after ourselves or our family for, I now think it's up to maybe seven days. It used to be a three day period at least, but that's water and foods and medications. Uh, and family does include pets. So you need to make sure you can have those kind of supplies in place ahead of some kind of event uh, that might cut you off for a period of time. So more to come as we have storms move in, but just wanted to give that reminder out there. And then I will say for us, and I'll talk more about county operations as we get through this, but the, the COVID-19 uh, kind of world and those of us coming back to work, many of us are wearing masks, if not all the time, much of the time and certainly more than we ever did before. As county employees, we are completing daily questionnaires. Uh, we're doing temperature checks in, in most areas. Uh, Skin, it's not foolproof, but it is one thing that we can measure and monitor and we wanna make the workspace as safe for our employees coming back as well as safe for the public that would be visiting us. And again, I'll speak more to that, but we are doing the daily questionnaire that's uh, been recommended by the Department of Health and when we have somebody that answers yes to one of those questions about am I feeling well, do I have a temperature, all those things, we do have a system in place that responds pretty quickly out of our human resources department. So I do want to thank our employees for participating in that on a daily basis. And I do want to let the public know we're doing all things we can to make our other workspace safe for our employees and safe for those that visit. So as we start most of these, I get into a little bit of what the Board of Supervisors have done over the past time. And when I look back, uh, they, we were just ahead of their May 12th meeting, and I think most of what I covered then, the board, in fact, did uh, mention some of the things that might come up at their May 26th work session. So I believe I'll start there, and I apologize for the glasses and the reflection, but I have to have the glasses to see my notes or I'll miss something that I thought was important. So I'm going to slip those on and just run through this. If you have questions or things you think I need to clarify, Renee, please don't hesitate to interrupt me, and uh, uh, I'll go back to whatever that item might be. Well Will do. <laughs> You're not shy about getting in where you need to. Nope, nope. Very good. Well, listen, in May, the board did talk about the comprehensive plan update. that has been ongoing for almost a year now, or maybe just over a year now in terms of staff time and consultants. Still a, a big opportunity for our community to get involved, to share their opinion. It does drive growth, or at least the type of growth. We, the county, uh, do very little in terms of the actual development, but we do put the zoning in place, and this comp plan directs that, that tells developers where we want housing, or where we want shopping, or where we want industrial. And so it is your opportunity as a community to get involved. So I would encourage you to do that. A lot of information on our website. I'll give you my phone number at the end if you can't find out where to find us. Uh, and then there's some upcoming public meetings. I think in the August time frame, this is a real uh, big public push for information. So just want to encourage the community to stay involved with that. Uh, the other part of our May 26 work session, we talked about our capital improvement programs, our current year or really current year and prior. So that'd be fiscal year 20 and prior year capital projects. And those capital projects sort of carry over. So if we fund one in FY18 that's not yet built, that money is still out there and, and held in reserve as an FY18 project. So our prior year CIP were really $25 million worth of projects. They weren't part of the, um, in terms of the budget approval, they'd already been approved. So those funds are allocated. But we wanted to slow them down from a cash flow perspective. Back in the early days of COVID-19, uh, the March-April timeframe, we were worried about cash. Do we have enough cash on hand and how do we preserve that? Not knowing what the long-term financial implications might be, short or long-term, I guess is the right answer, because we feel much better about the short-term need. We're still wondering about the long-term impact in terms of the COVID-19. But we, there's $25 million worth of prior year projects we talked about with the Board of Supervisors, and we really put them in categories of proceed, slow them down, or stop them. 
And so they vary in terms of nature of everything from the maintenance of roofs to purchase of equipment to new projects, uh, just a variety of capital items for the county. And we said we were proceeding with $8 million worth of projects. And those are things that either already had gotten far enough along in the year, like the purchase of a fire truck, we'd already purchased it. So that was part of the 8 million and proceed to slow down, which were projects such as the purchase of the uh, Brickyard Landing property, uh, the riverfront at Chickahominy in terms of the riverfront restoration project. Uh, and another big one was the marina project in terms of the bidding of the phase one of our marina improvements that we would slow those projects down. So before we would expend any more money, we would come back to the Board of Supervisors and let them weigh in on that the timing of those uh, projects. And then we had five projects totaling about, well, excuse me, $5 million in projects that we just said we would stop uh, until further notice and we will bring those back at a, at a future time when we feel better about the financial certainty of where we are. So that was prior year and I think that's working pretty well. And we are bringing a couple of those projects that I mentioned back to the board at their July meeting. So we really have held off what we were trying to do, maybe award in April or May, and we're bringing a project to July. The, uh, two of those, the Brickyard Landing property purchase, about a million and a half dollars, it's half funded in grants. I think the board will want to proceed with that for future use for uh, county residents. And then the other one is the Chickahominy Riverfront Shoreline. Again, another significant funding project, about a million and a half dollars, but it's about 50-50 local funds and grant funds. And so those will be two that we had slowed down on that will, I think will be ready to proceed. The other part of the work session was talking about our five-year CIP. And we, we have um, in our budget process and on our proposed budget, we put out $145 million in capital needs over the next five years. And that's between the schools and the county. Um, but about $30 million a year, and we do that through cash funding and borrowing funds. So it's a combination of those two. But in looking at our revenues and the growth in our revenues, we can't support that. And you're going forward in time, if we pay for those capital projects, we have virtually no room to grow our operational budgets. And operational budgets grow just in salary increases for employees, cost of insurance, cost of fuel, all those things. And so that's really not a sustainable path that we're on in terms of uh, where our revenues are projected to grow and where we are. And so we were talking with the board of this $145 million worth of projects. We either need to reduce some of those projects and push them further out or not do them, or we need to generate more revenue or a combination of both. And so I think those will be the ongoing discussions uh, for the next uh, few years, I say next few months, not years. Uh, so as we go into our next budget year, we have a better five-year outlook in terms of projects. Two projects that I did talk with the board that in, in being here this past year and a half that I think today we don't need to move forward with. One is Fire Station 6. It's about a nine and a half million dollar project. So it's one of those things that um, if we need it, we need it, but we wanna make sure. And in talking with Chief Ash, uh, I think we can serve the community in almost as good a manner. I mean, there's pros and cons to either option by adding another ladder, or engine, ladder engine company to station Fire Station 3. It basically puts more personnel, better response to area that is a highly served area. And the chief has a, it's a reserve engine that we were gonna put back in service. So the chief felt that was a very good option for us. Virtually no cost other than the staff we've already hired because we were pre-hiring staff for Fire Station 6. So we will hold on to those staff. We will staff this engine company and it'll be in service in the spring versus still being a couple years. And so our delivery to the community in terms of response time should go uh, be much better served in the short term. And then Fire Station 6 would push out into year eight or nine or 10 versus being next year. So that's a, a nine and a half million dollar project that we were able to delay. The other is the Ambler House um, fire hydrant project. And I don't want to confuse that with not moving forward with the Ambler House project. We've done about a half million dollar renovation of the exterior. We've had some interest internally of, of a public private partnership of somebody operating that facility. Uh, we would provide water and sewer service to it because that's different funding and less than $100,000. But it was $700,000 to have a fire hydrant and code requirements don't need that. So we are going to move forward. I don't want public to think that we're not concerned about the Ambler House and we're not installing a hydrant that might burn down. I think it's at risk of more at risk today being vacant than it would be being uh, occupied and with some uh, notification equipment that we can have installed in terms of if there's a fire there that would give us a call prior to somebody seeing it, whether there's smoke in the house and have those systems be able to contact uh, the fire department. So uh, those are at least uh, about $10 million in projects that we've whittled off that $145 million. I hope there are a few more, uh, but we'll have more discussion on that. 
And then the final thing with the May 26 work session that we brought up, and we were in the midst of our budget process for FY21, and it was school funding. We've had a lot of requests, and I'll talk a little more about that. But at the May 26 work session, the board did authorize uh, use of the end of your funds from the schools, about $2 million to go towards their FY21 budget, which helped fill a lot of their gaps. And then also about $1.7 million in CARES Act funding, uh, the board allocated to the school system for the purchase of laptops for students going into next year. So that is most of their May 26th meeting. Their June 9th meeting uh, had a lot of items, so I'm going to be very uh, summarizing of these so we don't get too lost in the detail but they accepted a number of grants or applied for grants in excess of four hundred fifty thousand dollars so i want to commend those departments doing that they had five tourist homes uh, to be considered under the uh, their uh, uh, public hearing items uh, they approved a few of those and denied a few of those but that looks for those that were approved operate as an airbnb or vrbo type rental uh, they accepted 6.7 million in the CARES Act funding, so we do have that money in our account now at this point, federal money that came through the state. They did adopt the FY 2021 annual budget, and again, I'm gonna come back to that. And then they had a couple of special use permit extensions um, uh, for Mason Park and Colonial Heritage. Uh, that moves on to the June 23rd work session. And again, I'll, I'll talk, uh, that was pretty significant in terms of, um, I guess the impact of COVID in our region. We added Bush Gardens as a, a discussion item late. Uh, if they're listening to the governor's announcement that we would likely be moving to phase three this week, and we're still on track for that, uh, that would allow Bush Gardens to open, but only with a thousand person, a thousand patron cap. Uh, and that just doesn't make it financially feasible for them to operate Water Country or Bush Gardens. So we invited the park president, Kevin Lipke, to, our board of, to the board of supervisors meeting along with all of our legislative de delegation. I think we had a really good conversation. Uh, Kevin Lipke has been very good at working with the Department of Health to develop a safe way to open. He shared that plan with our board of supervisors. He's talked about it at length with our legislators. There's a lot of good information out there about reopening the park in a safe manner but he's gotta be able to have more than a thousand patrons to make it work. And you know, I think his number, he, he would be hopeful for uh, as many as he can get, but a min bare minimum is around 5,000. If he doesn't have 5,000, the ability to have 5,000 people in the park, it doesn't let him reopen. And um, I really am concerned for Bush Gardens, for their employees, and then for all of the businesses that rely on them, from the hotels, to the restaurants, to the gas stations, to those kinds of things. And they do have a significant impact throughout our community. And so I want them to reopen in a safe manner. That's very important. I think they do have a plan, and we've put a lot of push and had good coverage on to find out that limit. So we'll see. Uh, but he's also said it takes two or three weeks from the date he's told he can open to open. And so that's a, another concern. If we tell him today he can reopen, he still will be the end of July before he's open. And so we've got to work through that. And we're still pushing on that. Uh, in the July 23rd work session, the board also accepted about $550,000 in grants. Uh, they added Juneteenth as a county holiday. And I don't want to gloss over that too quickly. I think that's very significant. Uh, the governor announced on Tuesday ahead of the Friday holiday that he was gonna grant that as a state holiday. We talked with other localities throughout Hampton Roads. Most were adding the Juneteenth holiday, some by, because they followed the state system, others because they felt that it was important. And our board agreed to allow us to add that holiday as a county holiday with more discussion to come about the significance of it as we move forward in time. But I do wanna say it, it does matter. And those are things as the governor had uh, indicated that you know the things that we celebrate, the holidays we take are symbols of what we believe are important today. Uh, and the freeing of um, uh, the slaves in, in Texas, which is what Juneteenth really commemorates, is basically the end of slavery in the U.S. And I think that really is something that we ought to all celebrate and commemorate. So more coming on that. And I do want to thank the Board of Supervisors for approving that holiday for county employees. In approving it, we did remove a floating holiday. So those worried about cost to the county and those kinds of things. We really took a holiday that was meant to be a floating holiday so an employee could use it when it made sense to them and turned it into a permanent holiday for the county. So it should be very little additional cost uh, to the taxpayers that support those holidays for us. Um, and then we did have a CARES Act and FEMA funding kind of update from our FMS director, Sharon Day. A lot of information is still out there. What's the best? This is a FEMA declared disaster that we're in with the COVID-19. I've never been in one that lasted so long. These are usually a, a few weeks in terms of the emergency. This one has been ongoing and is still ongoing. And so we're still trying to make sure we make the best use of funding that's available to the community and, and leverage it to our, the best of our ability. So taxpayers, at least locally, get all that we can get for them. 
All right. Do I need to take a breath for a night? Because I have a few more things. <laughs> I think you're doing a great job. Uh, you can okay. just well, keep on going. All right. Well, very good. Well, a couple of things, uh, just a matter of just some routine business, our convenience centers. We work with general services and our uh, staff, uh, solid waste staff. We put a lot of effort into cleaning up the appearances of our convenience centers. Yes, it's a place you take trash, but it still ought to be clean and organized and make sense. Uh, and you ought to feel like you, I want folks to be impressed when they go through there. So our staff has put a lot of effort into that. I hope you'll notice that when you when you head out to there to take your recycling or take your trash or take your debris, store your limp woody debris. Uh, a big change at Jolly Pond will be the traffic flow pattern. We have rerouted it. So when you come in the gate, you really pass where you used to go. You go down a little further and the hope was to stop backing up traffic on Jolly Pond Road. And so oftentimes we would have two or three vehicles uh, waiting to get into the site. They would be backed up on the road, a, a very unsafe condition. And so you may still be backed up two or three vehicles, but we at least have some queuing or some storage on site so you can be off the road. And then we've talked about a Grove Convenience Center uh, near Fire Station 2. Uh, and just uh, want to let our community know that we have uh, purchased that property. We do have title to it in the county's name as of last week. So we do have the site for our future Grove Convenience Center and Fire Station 2. The actual uh, moving forward is a, delayed a little bit by COVID, but I hope we'll talk about that later in a, a fiscal year of FY21, meaning sometime this fall, that we can talk about moving that project forward. I do want to come back and talk about COVID-19. It's too, too, been too big a part of our most of our lives for the past three months. Um, I want to, you know, as we enter phase three, I think we all get a little more relaxed, we get a little more comfortable, and I just want to reiterate that I think we're still in a pretty significant health event, and we all need to take precautions. Uh, you know, we need to be safe in washing our hands and the social distancing, wearing masks where appropriate. Um, in terms of businesses, I think it's a significant step because it gives them a lot more capacity to operate. In terms of the county, not a whole lot will change for us because we've been open to the public. Um, you may need an appointment to come meet with us. So I'd encourage you to call ahead if possible and make sure that where you're headed, do you have to do anything special to get in? I certainly want to encourage the public to wear masks when they come see us, if they're able to. Uh, at this point, I think most of us believe the mask help me not infect you if I happen to be a carrier. And so we are trying to wear masks on our side when we can't social distance. So our forward facing, me as well, got them right in hand and close by. So, uh, but our forward-facing employees will be wearing masks when they interact with you. We certainly would encourage you to be respectful of them and do your part where you can uh, to wear your mask as well and, may, or, and or maintain your six-foot distance. So we're here. Again, phase three doesn't change a whole lot for us. It does lessen some of the rules in our rec center, some of the rules around our pools, and some in our parks. Uh, but by and large, my message to the community is we're here to serve, and so please call on us if we can help. Um, mentioning the rec center, we did have a case with an employee at work in an area where patrons visit and the employee tested positive. We have notified patrons. That's going to occur. As I said, this virus is still here. Uh, HIPAA requirements only allow us to share very general information with our employee group or with the public. And so please be patient with us and have some understanding when we tell you that we had an employee test positive and you may have had interaction. We can only speak in general terms and we're trying to just make you aware so that you can pay attention to you to see if you need to take precautions or if you've not been feeling well or if you need to maybe stay away from other folks in your family. So it's not that we don't want to share, it's just trying to protect the privacy of the employees that are required by federal law that we have to comply with. So more to come on that, I'm sure. I do want to talk about budgets because COVID-19 has had a significant impact on both our current year budget and our our next year's budget. So for the current year, we started with a, about a $212 million general fund budget. Late in the year, we, we decided we needed to do about a 4% reduction based on what we thought the revenue projections would be, or about $7.6 million. We shared that reduction with the schools, and I'll speak more to that in a minute. Um, but again, that's hard to do at the end of a year with three months left to reduce 4% from the annual budget. I commend our departments and the school system for working really well, and I'm very pleased that as of uh, last week, we appear to be tracking such that our revenues for the year will exceed our expenditures. Uh, and that's really good news for us. It means we're gonna add to our savings or our fund balance and increase the county's cash on hand. Again, it didn't come without some sacrifices in our departments and with the school system, um, but I do wanna thank all those involved and to let the community know that financially we're tracking uh, very well. For next year, we got into discussions with the Board of Supervisors about what next year looks like and what we expect the financial impact from the COVID-19 to be. Uh, we are a tourist community, so we do expect to have 
tourist related revenue shortfalls. And again, it's hard to quantify exactly what those are to the county, uh, but the numbers we put together indicate tourists probably have a 15 to $19 million impact. And it's through mostly sales tax, whether it's the historic triangle tax, whether it's our local sales tax, or whether it's our sales tax for education, those are the area that we expect to have the biggest impact. And to us, there are some other tourism related items from your lodging stays that will have some impact. And then there's some other things with park rentals and other that are very small parts. But again, about a 15 to 18 million, uh, $19 million impact is what we've estimated from a tourism total impact. Not that we'll lose that much. We won't lose all, but a significant part of it. So as we get into the budget and talk with the Board of Supervisors, we talked about 5, 10, 20, uh, percent reductions in our, in our annual budget over, over the proposed. And what the board settled on was about a 10% reduction, which is about $20 million. And just coincidentally, that's pretty close to what the tourism revenue might look like. So, um, and that's hard. That, that $20 million is real money. It means that the budget that they've adopted uh, at $196 million for FY21 is $15 million less than the current budget. And going backwards is always difficult. It's difficult in our personal lives, it's in terms of financial, it's difficult for businesses, and it's difficult for your local government as well. And so we did share that um, the schools are 50% of our budget, so they had to absorb their proportionate share of that. And I will tell you that was hard for our departments, it was hard for the school system, it generated a lot of concern with parents about what that meant for schools. Um, and, and again, Folks would say, well, why do, you have to, why do the schools have to take such a big hit? They're not doing it in other counties. We, we fund on a very high level our schools because we're a wealthier community than others. And the state formula requires that we pay more for schools. And so the school system budget, we're about 80% of their funds. And so, but they're about 50% of the county. So I've tossed a lot of numbers, but the bottom line, there's not a way for the county to cut 10% out of its budget and it not have an impact on schools. They're just not. And that we do have a fund balance or a savings within our general fund. There were plenty of people that said, hey, this is an emergency. You ought to use it for that. The reality is going in to balance our budget with any significant use of that fund balance is not where I believe or our finance director believe we should be. And the board of supervisors supported that. So that was really was our pushing on the board to hold that money. We don't know the impact of COVID and what that will look like in December or next February. And we felt it was important to maintain that savings and do some hard cuts on the front end. In saying that, we had been working with school staff throughout the budget process, and that's what led to the May 26th uh, uh, approval by our Board of Supervisors to give them back $2 million of the year, end of year money and the $1.7 million in CARES money. That took some time and effort, and again, our staff were working very well together between the city, the county, and the school system. And I just want to let the community know we have those ongoing conversations and think we are working and looking after the best interests of all our community as well as including our students and our teachers and, and things of that nature. So it is important, and I do think we've ended up in a place that is a good compromise for where we uh, might otherwise be for this coming year. Um, final couple of things to, to, I guess, touch on. Um, we've had a lot of protests uh, in our community and around the state and nation in response to the death of George Floyd. And, and I do wanna thank all involved. I think the protesters uh, that have been here have been very well organized. They've been respectful. Uh, they've allowed us to share with us what their plans were. And so it's, I think it has worked very well in our community. And we, have, we very much appreciate that. I think we all support equal treatment for people. And we all are supportive of that for myself, to our police department, our board of supervisors, and to most, I think, hope all in our community. Um, but it takes people acting the right way and the protesters have really done a great job of that. I also want to commend our police department from our police chief to our officers that are responding. Uh, they've had a lot of hours in June uh, in addition to their normal schedules related to the protests and trying to ensure that the protesters were safe uh, and that when they stepped into, into a street they were also somewhat shielded from traffic because that is a dangerous area where traffic and people mix. Uh, and I do want to thank all of our officers involved for maintaining uh, and working and, and getting our community sort of on this path of where we're headed. The Board of Supervisors, along with the police chief, did reaffirm their commitment to equality for all. They had, had done that some years ago, and I know we'll have more conversations going forward on changes we might need to make, if any. I think we're open to that uh, and trying to make sure the community feels like we are working together to police in a fair manner to all. Uh, and then to where we have issues to try to address those issues. So more conversation to come, but I did want to thank those involved uh, for their actions and supporting that. Um, you know, something that has generated a lot of uh, 
interest ahead of July 4th. And uh, I know your favorite topic for today, Renee, are, are fireworks. Yes, yes. fireworks. Um, it is a very emotional topic, as are some other things. And, you know, in James City County, we do not allow the personal use of sparklers or fireworks. And, you know, there's a lot of pushback and, well, that doesn't make sense. I've done it my whole life. And why can't we do it? And it really is geared around safety. Um, right. In my opinion. You know, the, well, yes, when I was young, did I have sparklers? Yes. Did I use uh, fireworks and those kinds of things? I have. Uh, did I enjoy them? Yeah, they were a lot of fun. But I also saw folks near me, friends of mine, with minor burns, and we were fortunate in hindsight. Uh, the sparklers themselves, I think uh, our fire marshal shell burned, is it 1,200 degrees? 1,200 degrees. That little thing on the stick that looks like a lot of fun and really sparkles <laughs> off and feels super good. If you touch it, it really would have a very significant impact on your child or whoever they might touch with that or another child. And so the intent behind restricting it is meant to be a good thing to keep you safe. Uh, I know it's generated a lot of conversation and probably will continue to right until July 4th, uh, but the rules are in place to try to make you be safe. And so this year, it's hard to tell you where to go right. to watch a fireworks display as many of them are canceled. Uh, so it will be a different July 4th for many of us, but regardless of whether you choose to follow the rules or not, I do ask that you be safe and operate fireworks or whatever else in as safe a manner as possible and don't let children uh, play with fireworks at all. That just doesn't end up in a good place. And so the rules for James City County is personal use is not allowed. Correct. And we would certainly try to encourage you to abide by that. Um, Correct. Anything else I need to come back to, Renee? I, like I said, <laughs> I had a lot to say, and so I just sort of got it all out there. But that's the end of my list uh, at the moment. I, I think that's it. And I think, of course, I'm going to go back to fireworks for a second, that we are not, James City County is not the only non-fun County on the peninsula. We are in good partners with all of the other localities. Um, I think that there may be a couple that have different rules, but for the most part, we're all in the same boat. And I think that this year is a good opportunity, like I said during the podcast with the fire marshal, to come up with some new traditions. And just because we can't blow things up does not mean that we can't celebrate freedom another way. Just, just my two cents. Absolutely. And I would take a little bit of point with being a non-fun. I know you've heard that a time or two. <laughs> and buzzkill. Buzzkill is the buzzkill. We're a very fun community mm -hmm. and county and would certainly look for folks to have fun in a different manner. Right. So to your point, I, I think there are ways to do that and to create some new traditions. Yes. Um, Oh, and I didn't give a number before I forget that. 253-6603. Uh, Again, my number, 253-6603. I'm happy to hear from anybody. Uh, we'll return your call. And uh, if you have questions or need information, um, we're going to do that for you. And you may trip me up. I'll probably say it again. But uh, just with everybody a reminder related to COVID-19, it's not gone. I think things are improving. But the virus is still there. It's just as transmissible, transmissionable today as it was in March, whatever that word might <laughs> whatever be. Whatever that word is. Um, you know, there's a lot of science going on behind the fact. I think that we will get to a treatment therapy. We will get to a vaccine. But that doesn't exist today. So right. it's still one of those things that we need to be careful. And so I would just encourage people to be safe. Enjoy going out. Enjoy the respiratory opening. Go shop. All those things are great. But you need to wash your hands. You need to wear your mask. Uh, and you need to stay uh, social, socially distanced where possible, in case I might forget that um, at the end here. I think that's all very important. Thank you so much. Now, I have not really been asking the fun questions just because it feels like such a different time, but what, what plans do you have for the fourth? You know, Renee, um, my plans will be, we, we've got a, a, a second home in, mm -hmm. in, uh, around the beach area of North Carolina. I will be there and, and I won't be doing any fireworks. Um, <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, I, I do think one of the communities there is still having a public display, uh, but I'll be with my two sons who are 19 and 22 and, um, and just have some family time playing cards and hopefully being on the water or around the water and uh, pretty simple thing. There's grass to mow and there's things, always chores to do, but um, but time with family is where I usually spend the fourth, and that's where I hope to be again this year. The many can I'll have that experience and see if my mother will fall into the mix. It's one of those things we balance safety and parenting, and, um, and so those are always you know, things we're talking about. But I expect to be with family over the fourth. 
All right. Very good. Well, we are moving our oldest into his new apartment on the third. So I plan on recuperating on the fourth. I'm not quite sure what our plans are, but um, I imagine relaxing is quite high up on that list. So. Well, good luck with that. And I hope Thank others you. are able to find a way that works for them this fourth as well. Even without being able to blow stuff up. Even without that. That's right. right. All right. Well, Scott, thank you so much as always. I know that these Zoom podcasts are a little different and one day we will get back, but there's no way we can do what we used to do with social distancing. So that's just not even an option. Not so, short term. That's right. Yep. So hopefully soon. So thanks so much. Well, that wraps up this episode of This Week in James City County. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, please take a moment to go online. On, we're at jamescitycountyva.gov slash podcast. And while there, you're going to be able to find all of our episodes as well as a form that you can give us feedback, show ideas. We would love to hear from you. So once again, thank you so much. And we will talk with you next week.